Hello, today I'm going to be talking about SARS coronavirus 2, responding to a public health emergency with the lens from a diagnostic manufacturer. My name is Jamie Phillips. I work at Roche Diagnostics in their medical and scientific affairs as a senior scientific affairs manager. I obtained my PhD from the University of Georgia in infectious diseases. Specifically, I studied coronaviruses during this time, looking at the genes that are associated with attenuation or pathogenicity. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to be going over a background on coronaviruses discussing the epidemiology of SARS coronavirus 2 to date, and then looking at the different diagnostic modalities that are available for SARS coronavirus 2. The World Health Organization was informed of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin in late December of 2019. Roughly one month later, the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. The novel pathogen was identified as SARS coronavirus 2 and was sequenced and named on January 7th. The disease that this pathogen causes has been named Coronavirus Disease 2019 or COVID 2019. Coronaviruses are the largest of all enveloped RNA viruses. Their genome is roughly 30,000 kilobases. They've got a large outer glycoprotein that is named the spike protein. When you view these viruses under an electron microscope, they have the appearance of a crown, thus the name coronavirus. These viruses are ubiquitous, uh, meaning they infect many different mammals uh, and have different intermediate hosts with various zoonotic transmission events. So not all coronaviruses are uh, this pandemic strain. Uh, there are known coronaviruses that circulate in the human population, and these viruses account for approximately 5 to 10% of all upper and lower respiratory tract infections annually. There have been two notable zoonotic transmission events with coronaviruses. The first notable one was severe acute respiratory syndrome, which occurred in China in 2002. And the more recent one was Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Virus, or MERS coronavirus, which occurred in Saudi Arabia in 2012. When we look at these two other zoonotic transmission events, we know that the intermediate host has been identified. So for the case of SARS coronavirus 1, we know that the intermediate host was the palm civet cat. In the case of MERS coronavirus, it has, been it has been identified as camels. However, when we're talking about SARS coronavirus 2, the intermediate host has not been officially elucidated. We know that there are copious amounts of virus that were present in a wild market in Wuhan, China, but the exact animal that is responsible for transmitting into the human population has not been identified. So let's take a look back at late January of the total number of confirmed cases. Looking at John Hopkins data, we see that China was reporting roughly 2,800 cases and there were roughly 80 deaths. Moving into March, we see this virus has spread globally and at this point, there are roughly half a million total confirmed cases and 24,000 deaths. A few weeks later, um, on April 7th, the count was 1.38 confirmed million cases. Sorry. Moving forward to April 7th, we see the total number of confirmed cases is roughly 1.38 million, and the deaths total to 78,000. Early May, the number of total confirmed cases had increased to 3.5 million, and the total deaths were around 250,000. And we see in June, we are now up to 6.2 million confirmed cases and roughly 376,000 mortality events. So this virus continues to spread, and the need to identify those individuals who have been infected in order to isolate and treat them appropriately is paramount. 
We know that we have learned a lot about this novel pathogen, and this is evidenced by the number of weekly publications that are published on NCBI in peer-reviewed journals. Looking at a few of these publications, we can see that one study indicated out of uh, a population in Chicago, uh, there were 6,369 confirmed cases. Of that, only 64 or 1% were among children less than 17 years of age. Additionally, the majority of these children were not hospitalized. Those that were hospitalized had comorbidities such as diabetes or obesity. Looking at another study that characterized the clinical course of 1,000 patients in New York City, we see the most common symptoms in this population were cough, fever, and shortness of breath. We also saw that patients that were admitted to intensive care units were older and also predominantly male and had a long length of stay, ranging from 12 to 32 days with a median of 23 days. So at the time of this study, the criteria for testing evolved like many institutions have seen. In early March, the recommendation was only patients with symptoms in the hospital. Mid-March, it was updated to include patients showing symptoms and those who needed to be admitted to hospitals were at a high risk or were being discharged to congregate settings. In early April, the testing was expanded to all patients being admitted to hospitals. Looking generally, we know that the clinical symptoms that are associated with this disease are fever, respiratory symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, headache, and malaysia. However, we also know that this pathogen causes asymptomatic infections where the virus will replicate in an individual, but this person will not present with clinical symptoms that were previously mentioned. We don't know how long these individuals uh, remain asymptomatically infected. We also don't know the extent to how much virus they are shedding during this asymptomatic infection. Additionally, we don't know the percentage of asymptomatic infections that seroconvert, meaning uh, would have a, uh, a positive antibody response. These are all questions that we are still currently investigating at this time. The transmission has been identified person-to-person uh, -person via respiratory secretions and the incubation period or the time from when the in person was infected to the onset of clinical symptoms ranges from two to 14 days with a median of five days. We know that clinical progression occurs and this virus can cause severe respiratory disease leading to hospitalization and mortality events. So when we look at the clinical stages of COVID-19, we can break it into three different stages. Looking at this chart here, we see that severity of illness is on the y-axis, and it's the time of course on the x-axis. So for stage one, it's been identified as an early infection. Individuals are gonna be presenting with mild symptoms such as fever, dry cough. Stage two, we see that it's a pulmonary phase, and during this time, you see a shortness of breath hypoxia. Stage three, you see it's called the hyperinflammation phase, and you see a large increase in the host inflammatory response. Here, the clinical symptoms can consist of ARDS, fears, cardiac failure. Uh, we know that there are elevated biomarkers during this time point, such as CRP, LDH, or even IL-6, which has recently received EUA for this designation. There are current potential therapies, but for the purposes of today's talk, we are only going to be discussing diagnostic modalities. And we do see that the majority of patients typically only fall into this early stage one. So there's two critical features of a successful response to a pandemic. One, it's the early detection of infected individuals and two, the isolation of potentially infectious individuals. And so in order to properly 
detect these individuals, we need to understand the testing formats and their purpose. So as of current, there are available tests that are molecular tests, antigen tests, and serology tests. But in order to understand how we can utilize these tests, we really need to understand the stages of transient viral infections. So typically a person gets infected via the respiratory droplets, the virus uh, enters the host cell and then hijacks the host cell to manufacture more of itself. Uh, the immune system will start to respond due to this replication, typically the first immunoglobins that are present are going to be your IgM. These are your pentamers. And then as the disease progresses, you're going to have a selection process of high affinity immunoglobins that are typically neutralizing. And ultimately, the ideal situation is that the virus is eliminated and the individual recovers. So when we are looking at these tests, we need to understand what we are trying to find out in order to decide what modality should be used. If a person is currently infected with SARS coronavirus and we want to understand if they are or are not, then we would want to be using a nucleic acid amplification test, a NAT test, which be, would be identifying the genetic material of the pathogen, or an antigen test, which would be identifying an antigen of the pathogen as opposed to if we are asking the question, has a person previously been infected with SARS coronavirus 2? If this is the qu question, we really want to be using a serology test to identify those antibodies that are present due to the infection. So when we look at the infection, we can see here the estimated course of molecular and serological biomarkers. So you can see that the dotted lines here indicates symptom onset. And so we talked about this virus having an incubation period, uh, a period where the individual is exposed to the pathogen, but doesn't necessarily present with clinical symptoms. At the time of symptom onset, you are near uh, peak viral replication. And so it is optimal at this time to be utilizing uh, you know, PCR or another form of NAT or an antigen-based test. However, as the disease progresses, you can see that your um, by week three, in between week two and three, is your median day of seroconversion, meaning that you will be uh, immunoglobin positive. And there is an instance where an individual could be positive for PCR and uh, positive for the immunoglobin. So that's important too to understand how you could get both of those results depending on where the individual is in the course of the infection. So what we can see here is that there are many targets for SARS coronavirus 2 diagnostic tests. This virus has several proteins, the membrane protein, the envelope, and the spike protein, as well as a nucleocapsid protein that all can be identified. The immunoglobins, or the serology assays, again, are identifying the immune response to these specific antigens. So let's look at what the CDC, as of May 6, was recommending as a priority for nucleic acid or antigen tests. At this time, they place a high priority on hospitalized patients with symptoms, healthcare facility workers, workers in congregate living settings, and first responders, again, with symptoms. They also place a high priority on residents in long-term care facilities or other congregate living settings, including prisons and shelters with symptoms. They updated this to include priorities for also with persons with symptoms of COVID-19 infection, including fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, new loss of taste or smell, vomiting or diarrhea, and or sore throat, or persons without symptoms who have been prioritized by health departments or clinicians for any reason. 
So let's take a look at this timeline. Above the month, you can see Roche-specific activities, and below, you can see rest of world. So just to reorient everyone, late December is when the first report of the unknown pneumonia cases were reported. By February 14th, Roche had manufactured a research use only assay that was available in the US. March 13th, roughly one month later, Roche received their EUA for a high throughput molecular test. So this test could be run on two different platforms, the 6800 or the 8800. And it was identifying three regions of the genome of the virus. So again, this is looking at the nucleic acid. The intended use was a qualitative detection of this nucleic acid. And the specimens could be clinician instructed self selected nasal swabs or clinician collected nasal, nasopharyngeal, and orphangeal swabs. So a positive result was indicative of the presence of SARS coronavirus 2 RNA. These are the two platforms that this test could run on. The 6800 is on your left, the 8800 is on your right. And respectively, these two platforms can yield about 384 results or 1800 results per eight hour shift. So going back to this timeline, we've added a few months on here, and we can see that in May, Roche launched a anti-SARS coronavirus 2 assay. So this is a serology assay, identifying if an individual has been infected. Additionally, uh, current date, looking at June, uh, the pipeline for SARS coronavirus assays specific for point of care use are underway. So briefly going back to the um, serology assay that was launched in early May, uh, we know that there are many antibodies that can be identified due to the host immune response. Um, and typically, you know, as mentioned early during this section, you see the IgM, and as the disease progresses, uh, you end up with high affinity IgG. So we know that um, the test is able to detect these high affinity IgG uh, immunoglobins, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Some of the things that are still currently being researched are, is this immunological response protective? Um, and does the presence of antibodies indicate immunity? And if so, how long does that immunity last? A question that I know is top of mind is how long will it take to reach herd immunity um, via either infections or vaccinations? And so there's still a lot of unknown um, information uh, that hopefully will begin to be published within the next few weeks. So let's take a, a step away from the molecular and the immunoglobin tests that are high throughput, large tests, typically operated in a laboratory. And let's talk about some point of care tests specific for SARS coronavirus 2. So we know that there are molecular point of care tests, and these platforms are often small and portable and are optimal for deployment to remote or outbreak and crisis situations. These have a much lower thro throughput, though, in comparison to the aforementioned molecular test. Um, and typically, you can run one sample at a time, anywhere from five to 30 minutes. So because of the low throughput uh, and the time that it takes for a single sample, really, these tests are not feasible to test, say, an entire manufacturing facility of 1,000 employees. Um, however, they can be extremely useful in situations where you have a critically ill uh, patient who needs to have a diagnosis uh, within minutes um, in order to impact their care. So there are several um, EUA-approved SARS coronavirus 2 molecular point of care platforms. Um, what's important to note is that they, they all differ. So many times they're targeting different regions of the genome. Uh, 
Uh, they have different analytical sen sensitivity claims. Uh, they have different throughput, um, different hands-on time, as well as um, different assay run times, but all extremely useful in different settings. In addition to the molecular point of care test, um, there are antigen tests that are on the market and more to come. Uh, and so these diagnostic tests quickly detect fragments of proteins that are found within the virus. Um, it's thought that these tests are typically less sensitive when comparing to molecular tests because there is no amplification step uh, in the traditional technology of these tests. The last uh, potential point of care test is the antibody test. And again, much like the aforementioned high throughput serology test, these tests are identifying immunoglobins. But again, they are single use, low throughput, and lateral flow technology. Uh, so they're simple to use. Um, oftentimes, they, the sample can be collected through the use of a fingertip, a uh, finger stick. Um, so, again, the limitations in our understanding around the immune response still exist, um, but I do foresee these tests having um, high utility in the future as some of these answers uh, become available. And so, with that, I would be happy to discuss any of your questions. Thank you so much.